Okay, so we jump right into the pharmacology course, our first unit and the first lesson in that unit. This is all very definitely core material stuff you need to know. We're in the IVIO unit. We're going to talk about fluid and setup. So there's really two basic types or categories of IV fluids. The colloids, which are rarely if ever used in the field. I don't think I've ever seen it. And then crystalloids, which is the, the common choice that we all use. Crystalloids come in various different types. There's saline, any of its flavors. There's lactated ringers, and there's D5W. Uh, most services these days are just using saline. Now we're going to get into a discussion here a little bit about tonicity, and so whether a, fl a fluid choice is isotonic or hypertonic or hypotonic, but we want to lay out all the crystalloids there in one place. Most services these days, I think, are carrying saline, and then a few are carrying LR, and there's just not much D5 that's out there. So tonicity. Tonicity basically means the salt content, because this basic fact of life is that water follows salt. So if you were to put a fluid into a patient's blood vessels that has more salt in it than the surrounding tissues in the body, then water would follow that salt and fluid would be drawn into the vascular space. In general, think of it that there's three spaces in the body. There's the vascular space, the intracellular space, and then the space between those two spaces, the interstitial space. And so if we were to put a fluid into the vascular space that was higher in salt content than the interstitial or intracellular space, then water would be drawn from those into the vascular space, which might make some sense and allow us to fill up the volume in the vascular space. That's a temporary change, but it might be that that's, that temporary is all we need and it buys some time. So isotonic fluids have the same tonicity, the same salt content, salt, same salt concentration as regular body fluid and they really won't um, do very much in terms of drawing in extra fluid from the body. If you put a liter of an isotonic fluid in the patient's vascular space, you've increased his vascular volume by a liter. Hypertonic, on the other hand, actually pulls water in and also lasts in the vascular space longer, whereas hypotonic rapidly leaves the vascular space. I can't think of an application for hypotonic in the field anymore. In years past, we used to use D5W on our cardiac patients or our respiratory patients because we didn't want to really add any volume to their vascular space. We were just running IV fluids in order to give medications through it. But that's kind of a, a practice from the past now. Isotonic is what everybody uses every day, and then there are some hypertonic fluids that may make their way into your practice during your career. The next big idea is that we're not talking about pH. We're talking about tonicity. So normal saline is normal because it has the same tonicity. It is isotonic, has the same salt content as body fluid. It has nothing to do with pH. As a matter of fact, normal saline has an abnormal pH. Normal saline's pH is 5.5. .5. Normal body pH is 7.4. So normal saline is acidic compared to normal body pH. You give a large volume of normal saline, you can lower the body's pH. pH is important for cellular function, and uh, so an acidotic environment is not, not a good thing. So we want to make sure you realize that while the fluid is isotonic, that does not mean it has the same pH. In years past, several years ago, a decade or more ago, a large volume IV fluid resuscitation was the norm. Um, and we almost measured our competency as paramedics by our ability to give large quantities of fluid, four or five liters of fluid during the, the pre-hospital part of the patient's care. And knowledge has evolved, practice has changed, fortunately, and now we realize that giving large amounts of IV fluids can do three bad things. It can mess up body temp, especially if those fluids are a little bit cooler than, than the normal body temp. And even if you have your fluids on a warmer, all year long, and you should have your fluids on a warmer all year long, I doubt that they're going to stay at 98 degrees during their administration. They're going to lose some fluid, well, I'm sorry, lose some temperature. So as you give fluid, you're going to lower 
body temp to some degree. The body, when it's under stress, need, doesn't have any uh, capacity to, to raise body temp or maintain body temp. The last thing we ought to be doing is cooling our patients off. The other thing that large amounts of fluid can do can mess up the pH. Obviously, we talked about abnormal saline having a pH of 5.5, and so that can definitely disrupt uh, the pH if you give large volumes of, uh, of those acidic, relatively acidic um, IV fluids. And it can also mess up clotting mechanisms. So as clots start to form, good clots in a trauma patient start to form, and then we wash them out with IV fluids. And really, I think if you look at what ends up killing trauma patients, Overall, it's hypothermia, acidosis, or disrupted clotting mechanisms, and all three of those can be linked to large volumes of IV fluid. However, we do need to give IV fluid. Sometimes it's to increase vascular volume. It's to treat low volume. Sometimes it's simply as a route to give medications. Normal saline works great for everything. Some services are still using LR uh, or have discontinued LR and then brought it back. There's some evidence out there and some burn experts that believe that LR is, is uh, superior to normal saline for your uh, severe burn patients. A few services still have some little bags of D5 around uh, that they both basically use for drips and infusions such as a dopamine or an epinephrine or something like that, rarely used, um, and saline works just as good. But you may run into some of these weird funky flavors of IV fluid on interfacility transfers. Um, because there are different fluids that are used in the ICU environment, and if you're doing an uh, interfacility transfer, you may run into one of those weird flavors. <clears throat> Typically, EMS, as I said, carries saline if you're carrying LR. The size of the bag, there's always liter bags out there. Some services will also carry 500 or 250 cc bags, uh, and just a very few are carrying little tiny bags, 50 cc or 100 cc bags. That's all about um, mixing medication drips, infusions, which we'll get into much more uh, later in the course and in the, in the real um, classroom portion of our paramedic program. But typically, I think if you were going to start an ambulance service from scratch these days, you would have several bags, several thousand cc liter bags of saline, and then you need something smaller also. You can't get away with just the thousand. Maybe you want a 500 cc in your first impact, or maybe you want uh, some 250 cc bags to do some uh, reasonable um, mixes of, of drips and things. Speaking of drips, there's, there's two types of drip sets out there, two categories of drip sets out there in the world. There's micro drip sets and there's macro drip sets. Now micro drip sets all over the universe come in one size. 60 drops makes one cc. These are little tiny drops. It takes 60 of these little itty bitty drops just to make one cc. Then there's macro sets. Now, if you know life was simple, then there'd just be one side of one size of macro set also. But life is definitely not simple, especially with pharmacology. We can't manage to call things just one thing. We have to have two or three different names that are synonymous, and we have to make things hard by having different macro drip sets. It's in all all likelihood the folks that are in your class section will there will be uh, somebody that works at a service uses a ten drop. Two or three other folks that have worked at 15 drop services. Um, here in Columbia, we use 20 drop sets all over town, uh, at least right now. That could change at a moment's notice. So, you know, there's just nothing consistent about macro. But you think of it as much bigger drops. On the micro drips, it takes 60 little tiny drops to make a CC. But on the macro drip set, it only takes maybe 10, or if it's a 15 drop set, 15. Much bigger drops. And you say, why do I really care? Well, you're going to care soon because this is how we regulate the amount of fluid volume that's being given and the rate and document and so drip sets becomes important. For now, know that there's micro drip sets and macro drip sets and that the macro comes in 10, 15s, or 20s. The good news is that most services will just carry the one size. So your service is a 10 drop service or a 15 drop service. They don't have both and they don't change back and forth. There are infusion pumps out there that are used extensively in the ER. Many, if not all, patients in the ER that are on an IV, um, are, the IV is on an infusion pump, an electronic pump that regulates um, the rate, keeps track of the volume that's given, and it's just a general patient safety thing. And because that it is important to the ER to have the patient on a pump, a lot of field services, at least those in Columbia, are using infusion pumps, sets, 
in the field. So it's a macro drip set, but it fits right into the infusion pump. So even if you don't have an infusion pump on your truck or you're not going to use it on this patient, and most of the time we don't, go ahead and start the drip set that is the infusion pump set that can be used by the ER. So your transfer of the patient to the ER and, and the continuum of care goes pretty smoothly there. They can simply take your field IV set, stick it on a pump, and, and everything's going just fine there. All drip sets, however, have three main parts. They have the drip chamber, they have a roller clamp that you um, roll up and down which squeezes the tubing down or relaxes the squeeze on the tubing and that regulates the flow. Then you have injection ports where you would hook in other IVs called piggyback IVs or you would uh, put a syringe in and give a medication. So all drip sets have these three main parts. Setting up the drip set is pretty easy. You check your fluid bag, make sure it's not expired, it's the right fluid, yada yada. You, uh, you open it up, get it out of its protective cover, uncap the spike, try not to touch that. Once you've uncapped it, the spike at the top of the drip chamber fits up into the IV bag, uh, breaks a, a seal that's there, and allows fluid to come out. Then you squeeze that drip chamber and get the drip chamber about halfway full um, so you can see drips dripping in it. And then uh, the roller clamp is used to adjust it to, to close the flow down or open the flow up. Those clamps come opened up uh, when they're brand new. So you can spike it and just drop the set and uh, let it drain out without having to open up the clamp right off the bat. And you really don't need to uncap the end of that uh, of the drip set, the, uh, the IV line that's going to go into the IV catheter. You don't need to uncap that. You're just asking for, for extra problems with, uh, with sterility. So... Uh, we'll show you this in class. A lot of you will come into class already knowing how to do this. If you don't, don't worry. We'll catch you up. It's way simple. It's first day stuff, and uh, we can work with you on that. And the last topic here real quickly is this uh, concept of burping the bag. Do you purge the air out of the bag so that if the IV bag were to run dry, there wouldn't be a large volume of air in there because you would already have expelled the air. Now, this is an ER nurse thing. There are several ER nurses in our system that are absolutely adamant that this is the right way to do it, and there's a few medics that have adopted this practice. Um, surveying the faculty and, and a lot of other folks that I consider to be excellent practitioners, none of us ever do this. Um, I understand how to do it. I was never taught to do it. I can sort of see the uh, need for it, but you may be working in an environment um, where your service insists that you burp the bag, so we'll show you how to do that. Uh, there's not solid research either way, and it's certainly not a standard practice nationwide. It is a, a standard practice locally. The idea is to get the air out, and either any way you go, bubbles are bad. We don't want bubbles in patients' veins, and so it does make sense, and it's real quick. You spike the bag, then you unspike the bag, and um, uh, burp the air out of it, and then re-spike it. So it, it really slows you down very little. So. Anyway, we'll talk about this in class, and we'll show you how to do all this stuff in class. And if you think you know how to do it, that's cool. We'll make you show us that you know how to do it the right way. If you've never seen it or touched it, don't worry. Uh, in about 10 minutes, you'll be expert at it. So that's the deal on fluids and IV setup.